start. Uh, before we continue, there have been a couple of questions about zero uh, point quantum fluctuations, so why I'm not including the one half in the harmonic oscillators. Uh, I forgot to mention, of course, uh, one should do that if uh, objects are very close to each other, such as so that uh, Casimir forces or other type of dispersion forces might be relevant. But here, all the distance will be very large, so there will be no Casimir forces whatsoever that are relevant. So uh, we can then just shift the Hamiltonian, the zero of energies in the Hamiltonian, such that we forget about these one halves. Okay. Right. So. Now let's discuss finally the interaction, the optomechanical interaction So we have defined the two normal modes, one for the mechanical mode, one for the electromagnetic degree of freedom. Now it comes the interaction. And again, with our plot. We have this mirror, then this movable one, and then there was this motion here, which we call X, <coughs> and then there is this cavity mode here, omega C, and the mechanical mode, omega M, <coughs> and then there is now the length of the cavity, L, that precisely because one end of the cavity can move, now depends on x in that setting, okay? Depends on the position of the mechanical oscillator. So since the, since the length of the cavity depends on the position, then this means that the resonance frequency of the resonator depends on the position of the mirror. And typically, since these fluctuations will, or this motion will be very uh, small in amplitude, you can tailor expand uh, this function and then you get the zero order term plus a term that is linear in x plus there will be terms of order square or more that to start we will neglect okay and this is of course this there are very uh, different ways to obtain the same result with different level of rigor uh, this is not the most rigorous way, but it gives a very nice physical intuition. So that's the mechanism. The resonance frequency of the resonator depends on the position of the mechanical degree of freedom. And by linearly expanding, you get this dependence here, which is linear in X. So then, basically, the interaction is constructed, or the Hamiltonian then is always constructed in this way. Now you say, oh, the resonance frequency of my oscillator depends on the position of the mechanical degree of freedom. Okay. And in a sense, by just doing that, that's a very uh, fast way to derive this optomechanical interaction. Okay? So that's again, you see, suddenly these are, before I didn't put this dependence, so these were two independent, not, not coupled harmonic oscillators. Now we're making that the resonance frequency of the cavity mode depends on x. Suddenly, you see there is an interaction here. Okay? And then what you do is, since you know these fluctuations will be small of the order of the zero point motion, you can expand this dependence here to first order, and then you just get this term. You get <coughs> Now you get, you, you do a Taylor expansion, then you have this term, which is the resonance frequency of the resonator when the mechanical mode is at equilibrium, at zero. And the first term in the Taylor expansion gives me this term that couples x, the position of the mechanical mode, with a dagger a, the number of photons in the cavity. Okay? And then I just uh, redefine things and in the following way. And now I now do the following. I now write x in terms of b plus b dagger, recall, 
and I, the constant in front, I define minus for convention, H, uh, J0. <coughs> And this is the famous optomechanical Hamiltonian, where J0 is a frequency that has been defined as like that. Okay. This is the so-called single photon. Uh, optomechanical coupling. Okay. So this is then the fundamental optomechanical Hamiltonian that models these dynamics of two, mechanic, two modes, the electromagnetic field mode and the mechanical mode that are coupled in this way, in this term. <coughs> okay. And this Hamiltonian, even though it looks kind of very, it's, it's very, you know, yeah, you can write very, you know, one line, it's actually not so simple. It's kind, kind of a complicated Hamiltonian, mainly because the Hamiltonian is what is called non-quadratic, okay? So non-quadratic Hamiltonians are Hamiltonians for which there are terms that contain more than two creation annihilation operators, okay? These are non-quadratic Hamiltonians, and you see this term here is non-quadratic. It contains three, uh, three creation relation operators, and Hamiltonians that are non-quadratic are also called non-Gaussian. Why? Because if you would start from a Gaussian state of both the mechanical mode and the harmonic oscillator in the presence of that Hamiltonian, by evolution under this Hamiltonian, you could create non-Gaussian states, the states which would have a negative Wigner function. Okay, so this is actually great news because this Hamiltonian is kind of kind of non-Gaussian, uh, non, uh, non and hence could lead to non-Gaussian physics, but there is a drawback. That, this G node, what is this G node? What is the, the coupling strength? The coupling strength, what it is? Physically, you can also understand what it is. It's, this, this number is telling me how much my resonance frequency changes if I move the mechanical mode by a zero-point fluctuation amplitude. And I said before that the larger the mass, the smaller the zero-point motion is. Hence, you can already expect that if you basically move very slow, very little the mechanical mode, you will not change so much the frequency of the cavity. And that's the case. Okay, so the larger the mass, the smaller G node is. Okay, and hence, even though this Hamiltonian is non-Gaussian and very interesting, it is very hard that this coupling is strong enough to be useful, okay? And today in optomechanics, many experimentalists try to devise clever uh, experimental settings where this G node is enhanced as large as possible. But it's hard, okay? So just stay with that in this message. Okay, so and again I say, uh, recall that this G node then has two interpretations. First. G naught tells me, uh, says uh, how much how much the frequency, the resonance frequency, the resonance frequency of the cavity mode shifts. Shifts if the mechanical mode if the mechanical mode is displaced by x0. Okay. <coughs> and as you can already guess, if you have a resonator, you might measure this resonance frequency with a lot of precision by maybe shining light and see how, how much light enters into the cavity or not and so on. Now, of course, if your resolution would be such that you are able to see these tiny changes in resonance frequency by the motion of X0, then you would be able to detect the motional, the motional fluctuations even at these small scales. And this sometimes can be done, okay? This is one interpretation. <coughs> 
Then another one from this Hamiltonian, another interpretation from this Hamiltonian. There, there, there are two, two physical uh, things that this Hamiltonian tells me. One, the one I said, the resonance frequency of the cavity is shifted by the motion. And the second one is that now you can also see that, as you remember, a force You can define a force as the, uh, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. Okay? And if you take the mean value of this force, the force that the mechanical mode uh, feels is, as mean value is from this Hamiltonian, is given by that. Because okay? I just take the derivative of with respect to x in this Hamiltonian and I have a force. And you see these forces, the force, the mechanical mode, the mechanical mirror feels due to the presence of some photons in the cavity. Okay, so this is the so-called radiation pressure. This is the, the you know, light exerts of pressure, it makes force into mechanical objects because the scattering of a photon from a surface imparts momentum. That's why the comets, the tail of the comets always point away from the sun because the sun is making radiation pressure into the comet from the electromagnetic field radiation. That's the same type of physics. Okay? So this is then, uh, <coughs> this is the so-called radiation pressure. Then from here you can also understand a bit, give another meaning to J0. So you see, if you have one photon in the cavity, J0 divided X0 is the force this photon makes into the mechanical mode. So if J0 would be larger for a single photon mode, for a single photon you would prep, make more force into the object. If you make more, more force to the object, you could actually sh move it away from its equilibrium point, namely you could excite phonons. Okay? So you see that's why these terms here, B and Bidaga, they can create phonons. And the rate at which they create phonons depends on A dagger A. So the more photons you have in the cavity, the more phonons, the more displacement you generate. Okay? So this is also encoded in this, in this Hamiltonian. <coughs> so in particular, now you could ask uh, how much how much displaced is the mechanical oscillator? in the presence of some electromagnetic field state in the cavity. Okay. So what you can see is if you take this Hamiltonian now, I write the, the, the mechanical mode again in its, in its p squared plus x squared form, and I add this term. Okay. I'm writing this Hamiltonian, now I write like this part, I write like p squared plus x squared, uh, and then this interaction term I write like that. Okay, I put x and divide x0, so it's the same. So this Hamiltonian then, actually you can also understand it as this, as having now your mechanical mode being displaced from its equilibrium point by a length scale xd, so displaced, okay? So you put some, there is some light now in the cavity and this, the, the mechanical mode is displaced from the equilibrium xd, where xd, right here, is nothing else but xj0, x0, m over, over m, so I write it in final form. And I think this is even better, it gives a better expression. Because it tells me, if I have one photon in the cavity, I displace the equilibrium point of the mechanical mirror by a distance given by x0, the zero point motion, times g0 over omega m, where that is the mechanical frequency. And this actually tells me something. It tells me, oh, if g0 
if the optomechanical single photon coupling rate will be larger than omega m, a single photon would displace the mechanical mode more than the zero point motion, which means that if, if you would be in the ground state where you have an harmonic, a nice wave packet, a single photon would displace the ground state wave function to a distance such that the new state is almost orthonormal to the other one. Okay, and this would only happen if G naught is larger than omega m. Okay, but of course that's hard. G naught is typically way smaller than omega m. But as I said before, some experiments try to achieve this regime where G naught is comparable to omega m and so on. Okay, so just to, this is all, all these things you can extract from, from this Hamiltonian. Okay, but again, all this discussion has to do with with the Hamiltonian, which describes just the coherent dynamics. Okay, and then I already said, okay, if G naught is comparable to omega, omega M, that's interesting. But of course, as always in quantum optics, what is important is how large the interaction is compared to the decoherence rate, to the dissipation rates of the two modes. This mechanical mode and this optical or electromagnetic field mode, they are not decoupled from the environment. They couple to the environment so they can decay at some time scale. If you put a photon into the cavity, it will not be there forever. If you, put a, if you excite a phonon into the mechanical mode, it will not be there forever. It will decay. And what matters is then how these decay rates compare to the interaction strength. Okay? So that's why now we, right, we right away move to the open optomechanics. Okay? So the idea is how large is G0. In particular, here what is relevant is not the absolute value, but how does it compare with the coherence rates? Questions about that? This is the fundamental Hamiltonian. It looks very simple, but it, it allows you in many situations to model very well the physics of a resonator mode coupled to a mechanical mode in many, many different experimental scenarios. In the microwave regime, in the optical regime, and so on. Okay, it's almost always boils down to this. Good. Now, as I said before, this system is open, so these degrees of freedom couple also to the environment, and hence one needs to describe optomechanics as an open quantum system. Okay. So the idea is both modes, both modes are coupled uh, to a bath. And recall that a bath we typically use in physics as a way to say other degrees of freedom we don't control or we don't we, we cannot yeah we cannot measure and so on. Okay, so in our picture of the optomechanical system. Okay. Now what happens is that the optical mode can decay or can couple to the bath with a rate kappa. I will use kappa. And the mechanical mode can also decay with a rate I will use gamma. Okay. And this means the optical mode couples to other degrees of freedom. For instance, it could couple because the mirror is not super perfectly smooth. There are some defects. Then a light, a photon that is scattered, is reflecting from the mirror, suddenly reflects by the impurity away from the cavity. And then instead of coming back to the cavity, it goes away from the cavity. So you lost it. So you couple to other electromagnetic field degrees of freedom. Or the mirror is not perfect, so it absorbs from time to time the photon. And then zuk, it, the, the electromagnetic field couples to the charges in the surface that couple to other degrees of freedom and zuk, dissipates to the rest of the, of, of the wall. 
the mechanical mode the same. These vibrations suddenly, you know, it might excite other vibrational modes in these structures. So if you have a, a mirror, you are looking at the center of mass mode, but maybe from time to time you also excite kind of internal vibrations. Or uh, this mode then couples to the rest of the other acoustic modes in the material and so on. So it can happen, of course. <coughs> okay, so let us focus then first on how to describe the, a lossy and uh, mechanical mode. Okay, so and the idea is it will be su sufficient to just treat it as a mechanical mode coupled uh, to a thermal bath a thermal bath of temperature T. With damping rate, and this will come in a second how I define these things, damping rate gamma. Okay. So the idea is now you have this harmonic oscillator, which has, is defined by a frequency H bar omega m. And this harmonic oscillator is not isolated in the world. It couples to many other degrees of freedom that they have some temperature because the, 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 the environment is in equilibrium at some temperature T. And very generally, I just say, okay, it couples to a bath of temperature T. Okay? And the coupling rate, uh, it will be related to some so-called damping rate. It will come in a second, gamma. Okay? So then the, the, these two new parameters appear. The temperature of the bath, T, and the damping rate, gamma. Okay? And in nature, you can never be completely isolated. You can never make damping equal to zero. It will, it, it's amazing how well you can isolate these uh, systems, but not perfectly. Fundamentally, you will always isolate. For instance, if the object has some temperature, it means it's, it has some temperature. This massive, massive object is emitting uh, electromagnetic radiation through black body radiation because it has some temperature, it emits radiation. Every time I emit radiation, I, I, I send momentum away from the object, so I recoil. And since this happens stochastically, I'm recalling in all directions, so I also heat up the center of mass motion. So there is always fundamentally a way to couple to the bath. Okay? And uh, we will parameterize it in this way. So in quantum optics, <coughs> What you can do, maybe you discussed that already in the lectures on open quantum systems. You could have a mechanical mode. So you have an harmonic oscillator, and the standard model is you assume it is coupled to an infinite bath of harmonic oscillators. You trace them out, and you derive an effective master equation. For instance, the so-called uh, quantum Brownian master equation, or the, or the caldera uh, Leggett model, and so on. So I will not discuss this, how it's done. I will just tell you. Uh, the result. So typically, if you, in the presence of an harmonic oscillator coupled to such a thermal bath under usual conditions, the, the time evolution of the, of the density matrix can be written as this. It contains first the Schrodinger equation part of it, the coherent evolution, this, just that's the evolution due to the Hamiltonian, plus some terms that account for the dissipation. That I write like that, okay? So this is the coherent evolution. And these terms will describe the dissipative evolution. Okay, if I have a single harmonic oscillation, Again, this Hamiltonian is just h bar omega m b dagger b. So if there would be no dissipation, my the state of the mechanical mode would only evolve through the Schrodinger equation by this Hamiltonian. But now there is dissipation. And then there is additional term here. And this additional term can always be written in the following way. So it contains, in general, two contributions when you couple to a thermal bath. <coughs> It contains a contribution of that type. OK. 
Okay? So it's, it contains this term, gamma n bar m plus 1, and then these operators, b rho b daga minus 1 half b b daga, uh, sorry, b daga b rho. And this is an anti-commutator. Okay. So this, is, this has the form of what is called a Lindblad form, which guarantees that the evolution of the density matrix in the presence of this dynamical equation will send a, a density matrix to another density matrix. So it will keep the trace and will keep the positivity of the density matrix. So it, then it has this form. And it has this coefficient gamma n bar plus 1. And recall that this Lindblad form always has the same structure. It always has some operator, rho its daga, minus one half of, then you put the second operator in the first place and the first operator in the second. Okay, it has this form. And you should remember that. And if you remember that, then this, the first operator on the left of the rho tells you what the process is describing. So this, op this is telling me that this process is describing the fact that the number of excitations lowers. So this is the term that describes the decay of energy from the mechanical mode into the bath. Okay? And this process has a rate gamma, the damping rate, then n bar plus 1, where n bar, n bar I define in a second, but it's the, for, uh, it's the mean number, Bose Einstein mean number occupation for the frequency omega m and temperature t. The second term is the term in which you can put energy from the bath into the oscillator, and this goes with the rate. like that, and then I have the B dagger here. And like that. And then these Lindblad terms, there are a bit of an ambiguity. Sometimes we write it like that. Sometimes you will put, uh, you will divide by two here and multiply by two so that you have a two here and a one, and then you would have here two times gamma. And two times gamma, some people will define it as gamma. So then there might be a factor of two always in the gammas. That one has to be very, very careful. Okay? There is no clear ag agreement on how to do that. But there are all, all, always these two terms. This term reduces the energy of the oscillator, and this term increases the energy of the oscillator. Okay? So this term describes this arrow going up. The first term describes the arrow going down. And the point is that this n bar, we defined before, but I repeat, is like that. 1 over h bar omega m divided kBt, where t is the temperature of the bath. Okay. And then from this master equation, okay, you can now ch check in a second the following. From this master equation, one could now calculate what is the time derivative of the number of excitations in the mechanical oscillator as a function of time due to this master equation. Technically, this is nothing else but calculating the trace of rho square dot, so rho dot times b daga b. Okay? And then you substitute rho dot by the master equation there and you do these traces, okay? Uh, which, using commutation rules, you can always end up expressing as mean values of b daga b. And then what you would get is actually the following. You would get this equation. If you do it as an exercise, the time derivative of the number of phonons is basically given by that. <coughs> which again, this is the n bar over, over omega m, which th this can then be solved very easily. And then you have that the number of phonons as a function of time due to that master equation is basically given by that. Okay. 
This is a very nice, uh, very nice equation. This is the number of phonons I had initially. Okay, first of all, note that at t equal to zero, uh, basically this n cancels with this one, so I have, uh, I have this. Then at t going to infinity, since gamma is positive, I get that. That's my final state. It, of course, it gets, it equilibrates with the bath. But now, depending on whether my initial number of phonons is larger than the mean number of phonons in the bath or lower, I either decay or I hit. Okay, so there are always these two processes. So for sure, as a function of time, so for way larger than one, I end up with m bar. So here there is the m bar. And now there are two processes. Either if I start, if I start above m bar, I just decay. And if I start below, I just heat up. But I always end up, okay? So that's what you would expect from an harmonic oscillator coupled to a bath. And these dynamics go as the damping rate. That's why we call gamma the damping rate, because that's the rate at which energy decays or increases. Okay? This comes from the master equation very nicely. Now, here it comes finally something relevant, which is <clears throat> now see that what is very important in this coupling to the bath is what is the ratio of h bar omega m divided kBT. Again, that's the frequency of the oscillator and that's the temperature of your bath. That's the temperature of your experiment. Then, it is very useful in, opt in quantum optics to recall the ratio of h bar divided kB. Uh, anyway, so what is the value of h bar in SI units? What is the power? 10 to the minus? 34. And kB? 20, 23, so the ratio, which, which is the power. And 11, that's what you need to recall. 10 to the 11, or 10 to the minus 11 if it's like that. Because then it tells you the following. If you have here a 10 to the minus 11, if I have one Kelvin, okay, then for omega m's, uh, larger than, uh, than 10 to the 11, this will be way larger than 1. Okay? And you see, since this is a 10 to the 11, it's a funny uh, power because microwaves are 10 to the 10 and optical frequencies are 10 to the 15. So here now there is a very important, uh, uh, important thing, which is that optical frequencies, even at room temperature, they will have a prefactor, this number will be way, way, way larger than one. Whereas microwave frequencies at optical, uh, at, at room temperatures, this is smaller than one, way smaller than one. Okay, so why is it relevant? Well, I just write it again, so I can write this as h bar kV 2 pi over some natural frequency, and this prefactor is 5 to the minus 11, and this is f over t. Well, first of all, so this one, okay, I, I, I went a bit too fast, so this ratio is correct, but now we are talking about the mechanical mode, and the mechanical mode, I said before, that typical frequencies for the mechanical mode uh, are of the order of 10 to the 6, maybe even 10 to the 9 uh, hertz. Okay, so this means that a mechanical oscillator at room temperature is, of course, not in the ground state, as you would expect. Even, uh, yeah, even at its highest frequencies. But you might know that today quantum optics experiments can also be done in, so what is the range of frequencies, uh, of temperatures, okay? So recall, so basically, if we put temperature, there is here at 300, there is room temperature experiments. Okay, these are experiments where you go to your colleagues and you enter into an optical lab, and of course everything is at room temperature. Then you could use kind of cryostats, which are 
uh, chip, which uh, this will be helium type of uh, uh, refrigerators where you are around four Kelvin. And then you can go to the most expensive uh, refrigerators, which are called dilution refrigerators, which in principle allow you to even go to 10 millikelvins. Okay, so 10 to the minus 2. This is temperature in kelvins. This is important. To, to re so experiments are either done at room temperature at around 4 kelvins or at 10 to the minus 2 or so, okay, or 100 milligrams. Then you might be surprised that the first experiment that showed a mechanical oscillator in the ground state was done by just taking a very nice high oscillator frequency, uh, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, and putting it in a dilution refrigerator and then it was automatically cooled to the ground state, and they observed that. That was done in the group of Andrew Cleland in Santa Barbara in 2010. You can check that, and moreover, they coupled this mechanical mode to a qubit, and they saw some nice Rabi oscillations. Okay. If you want then to cool a mechanical mode of lower frequency, or you want to cool a mechanical mode in, at room temperature, you need to do something else. You have to remove this thermal excitation somehow, and this will, of course, be done by a, the use the coupling with the lasers. And this will be the discussion this afternoon, how to do laser cooling. Okay, but please keep in mind uh, these, these numbers here, which are relevant. Okay? So, <clears throat> last comment about the mechanical mode is that in optomechanics, to give a strength of how well the mechanical mode is isolated, we talk about mechanical quality factors. Mechanical quality factor, which is defined as <coughs> omega m over gamma. This is a dimensionless parameter. And recall that a mechanical quality factor, you can already see from this equation, it tells you basically how much energy can you put or remove from the system in a, in a oscillating period. Because if in a period, gamma times period would be of the order of Q. And uh, how much energy changes in, in, in such a time is given by Q. Okay? Anyways, that's a definition. And for a given frequency, it tells me what is the damping rate. And ideally, for optomechanics, you want mechanical you want to devise mechanical modes which have Qs as large as possible. Okay? If, you, if Q is not large, it will be hard for you to do interesting uh, stuff in optomechanics. And uh, these Qs now are amazing. So there are systems where these Qs typically range from 10 to the 5, okay? up to crazy systems where Qs are of the order of even 10 to the 12, okay? which if you put numbers, uh, you would see that a phonon, so a vibration, uh, 10 to the 12, there were some nice experiments in Caltech in the group of Oscar Painter with a very tiny structure where you have phonons uh, that vibrate. So in a such an isolated way that this vibration, if you put it in a length, it would vibrate over kilometers, even distances longer than what a photon survives in an optical fiber. All right, so it's, uh, it's really amazing. So yeah, so you can now, there are, you check uh, quality factors in optomechanics, you will get these nice plots where they tell you different experiments on what is the Q they have. Okay. Good. Okay, so that's regarding the mechanical mode. So that's how we will model a mechanical mode coupled to the environment by uh, this dissipator. Then what about now the cavity mode, which will be also open. Okay, the important thing is that typically the cavity is open also on purpose because you make one of these mirrors not really perfect. You, you want these mirrors to be <coughs> <coughs> sorry, a bit transmittive so that they can, they can transmit radiation because then this is used to actually put light in it because you drive here and then some of the light enters 
and also to read out the state inside the cavity. And I put always these drawings, but the, this concept applies also to microwave cavities, okay? So, and the coupling, if you want here, is given by the rate uh, kappa, which is called photon decay rate or so on. There are many names, but it's kappa. The important thing, as opposed to the mechanical mode, is that for sure we will always be in a scenarios where the, the, phonon num uh, the photon number occupation at the resonance frequency will be basically zero, okay? So the electromagnetic field mode in my experiment is always in the ground state. This will be always a condition. If it is not, then you will not be able to do, it will be everything more complicated. Is it easy or hard to achieve that condition? Well, you see now from here. So if my, optica, if my mode is optical, I have a frequency of 10 to the 15 here. So even at room temperature, this is way fulfilled, okay? So this is always nice to recall that optical modes, uh, when, uh, when you switch off, so if you put all this room in the dark, so you really switch off all the light, even though we are at room temperature, actually optical modes are empty. They are in the ground state, in the quantum ground state. Okay. So that's why we don't see light. <laughs> Whereas uh, if we would go, if our eyes would be sensitive to microwave radiation, uh, uh, even though we would be in the dark, uh, there would be, you would see light in that sense, okay? So at room temperature. But then, this then means optical experiments require room temperature, whereas microwave experiments Microwave experiments require these temperatures, dilution refrigeration, because if F is of the order of 10 to the 10, you need uh, these of the order of 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 2 to make this very large, so that the n bar is, is, is uh, smaller than 1. So that's very important. Require dilution And actually, that's why all the experiments that have to do with microwave optics, such as superconducting qubits, microwave cavities, or microwave optomechanics, and so on, take place always inside these amazing dilution refrigerators that they cool down the environment to hundreds or less millikelvins. Okay, which is no problem. They are very expensive, but if you have the chance to have one in your laboratory, then you can run the experiments inside, and the electromagnetic field radiation uh, will be in vacuum. What is amazing, and we are not, uh, I think we are so used to it that we never think about it, is that why all these quantum optics experiments are done in laboratories that you can visit and see there the experiments going on is because uh, at room temperature, the electromagnetic field modes are in vacuum, are in the quantum regime, okay? So that's why you can open, which is very, very nice. You know? Of course, the other modes, such as the mechanical mode at room temperature, will not be in the quantum regime. But the sense of why we can use lasers to cool objects to the quantum regime is precisely this one, as I will discuss later, which is that electromagnetic field modes at room temperature are in the quantum regime, are in the vacuum. That's why you can actually cool things also at room temperature to the quantum regime, okay? This we will discuss a bit more. But cooling has to do with uh, exchange of entropy, not so much about exchange of temperature, okay? And in that language, electromagnetic field modes at room temperature have very little entropy. They have basically zero entropy. They are in the vacuum, okay? So all of this comes from here. That's why it's so important. All right. <clears throat> so this means that the cavity mode has zero uh, n bar. So the dissipator will be the same, but n bar is zero. And if n bar is zero, this term disappears. And only this term survives which makes sense because this term is the term in which you provide energy into the bath, which you can do. But of course, this term should be zero because you cannot extract energy from a bath that is effectively at zero temperature, okay? So it makes total sense. So that's why one, uh, if one understands this, you don't need to memorize this structure. It has to be like that. The term that goes with B dagger should be proportional to M bar 
the terms that is with B should be n bar plus 1. Okay? <coughs> so hence, the cavity mode, when it is open, it will always be described as the Hamiltonian part as before. <coughs> plus now only one term here, kappa, which describes the decay. Okay, where this again is the good. All right. Then in the open cavity, there's also some imp very important aspect, which is that these cavities, these electromagnetic field resonators, can be driven. The fact that the mirror is open, it also allows me to put energy inside the cavity. And uh, in the Hamiltonian, this can be described by adding the following term to the Hamiltonian. So driving, the driving in the cavity The driving in the cavity now can be described as that. You can add a, a new term, which I write like that. Okay, this new term is Hermitian as it should be, and it contains two terms. There is this uh, 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 driving strength, which basically is proportional to the power at which you are driving the cavity. And the frequency here is the laser frequency or the driving frequency. Okay, this term I put now by hand, but can be derived uh, very rigorously for those experts. What happens is that this mirror, by not being perfectly uh, uh, reflective, it basically induces a tunneling between photons inside and photons outside. Okay, and this tunneling term will be of the form A daga A for the two modes. And now one mode, since it's driven, it's basically classical. So you can displace by a coherent state and then the operator disappears, you only get a, a, a C number. And typically, you describe this also in the, in, the inter, in the interaction picture with that mode. So that's why it's oscillating. Okay? So that's why it appears a time-dependent term. We don't have time to justify this, but just believe me, that's the case. All right. So then that means that now, finally, I can describe the most general or, or, or at least the standard setting in optomechanics, okay? which is you have the optomechanical system, which typically in general it can be driven. The resonator mode is driven, and of course the modes decay. So hence the total dynamics of the system can be described now in this beautiful and complete way. So. Basically, what we have is the total dynamics of the system, which now this is the density matrix of the joint mechanical mode and uh, electromagnetic normal mode, is then described by, by the following. It has the Hamiltonian part plus the dissipative terms, and the Hamiltonian part is
the Hamiltonian part is just the optomechanical term plus the term describing the driving of the electromagnetic resonator, which you can always put to zero, but in principle could be there at a given laser frequency and driving strength, plus the dissipators. And the dissipators now are three terms. Is the dissipator of the cavity, which only decays. the decay of the mechanical mode plus the fact that you can put energy into the mechanical mode from the bath. This is a very nice uh, model to describe such a general physical setting of a mechanical mode coupled to an optomechanical mode. So and again, see what are the parameters that are relevant. The frequency of the cavity mode, the frequency of the mechanical mode, the single photon optomechanical coupling, the driving strength of your resonator, the laser at uh, the frequency of the driving, the decay rate of the, photo, of the cavity mode, the damping rate of the mechanical mode, and basically the temperature of your bath. Okay? Given all these physical parameters, now you can explore a lot of different physics. And that's what people do in optomechanics. But the beautiful thing is that this model, theoretical model, allows you to describe a huge variety of physical systems in the microwave, in the optical, uh, all type of different mechanical modes. In a sense, all boils out boils down to, 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 to this uh, description, okay? So then as a quantum, if you are a quantum optics uh, theorist, as soon as you are given that, you already know you can study a lot of things, okay? So what we will do after, after lunch is basically to study a particular regime, which is a regime in which I assume I really drive, I'm really driving the cavity, okay, quite a lot so that I put many photons into the cavity mode. And then I want to look at the description of the fluctuations above this mean field where I have a lot of cavity photons. By doing that, we will do a trick where we will see that this Hamiltonian effectively linearizes, namely becomes quadratic. And by becoming quadratic, everything even simplifies more. You can solve then the dynamics exactly. And then we will focus how this linearized Hamiltonian in the presence of driving can be used to cool the mechanical mode to the quantum ground state. Okay, so that's the idea. But uh, uh, but from here you could study many other regimes. Now you could do research. Oh, what happens when G naught is larger than gamma, or G naught is larger than kappa gamma? And you know, depending on the hierarchy of the physical parameters involved in this, there are a lot of different type of physics that we could study. Of course, should we have more? more hours, but my idea is after lunch to focus on the perhaps most important application, namely that you can cool this mechanical mode to the ground state using these interactions. Um, I think we're over, no? Yeah. So do you, do you have questions? You asked me some very good questions in the break. Maybe you want to ask them now so that we can discuss with all of you at the same time. Uh, Yes. Why do you master equation? Why do you? Yeah, good, very good question. Because uh, 